34 years in this business, and I just recently looked up the definition of portrait. And according to Miriam Webster, a portrait is defined as a pictorial representation of a person, usually showing the face. But that's not how I define a portrait. I see a portrait as a moment of truth, the intersection between a moment in time, the presence of the subject, and the intuition of the photographer, a fraction of a second of truth. The result of that moment of truth is a portrait, usually put on display, that creates a connection between the subject or subjects and us, the viewers, allowing the viewers a glimpse into the moment of truth of others that tells us something about the people in the portrait. This is a portrait I did in October of 2002 of news anchor David Bloom and his family. The truth of this moment is shown in the lean of the daughter's head on the mom's shoulder, creating a circular composition and a tight bond between mom and daughters. Because the truth of this moment is that they, mom and daughters, would soon become a team on their own. Because the truth of this moment is that David would die just six months later while covering the war in Iraq and this was their last family portrait. Does it make you wonder sometimes as photographers whether we have some intuitive knowing in the choices that we make? So really, a portrait is a keen observation of the subject, a deep understanding of who they are to pull out their moment of truth to be put on display as a portrait that creates a connection to the viewer. No different, really, than a business, their brand, and their ideal customer, because the goal is the same. For a business to know their ideal customer so well, and then to create a brand to be put on display that connects them to your ideal audience. And that's why every portrait is a brand, and every brand is a portrait. They, your ideal customers, are your subjects. By understanding them so well, it's as if you're going to capture their portrait of the camera, and then by creating a brand that speaks to them, you will attract more of your ideal customers. So today is photo day. Remember photo day in elementary school? The bad haircuts? The outfit your mother made you wear? My mother did not make me wear this outfit. The warnings not to share combs because of head lice. Okay. So not exactly like that. Today you will learn how to create a true portrait of your ideal customers. And then you will capture that portrait, not with your camera, but with your brand. A brand message and image that's so compelling it will stop your ideal customers in their tracks. Today you will learn how to speak the lingo of your ideal customers. But before I connect the dots between branding and portraits, I want to take you back in time. Three years out of photography school, 20 years old, I go back to my hometown to start a photography business. Three years later, I'm in my studio one day. I walk into the back room of my studio. I leaned against the wall, I slid down the wall, and I sobbed. I sobbed because I had a failing business. Three years of struggling and working really hard day in and day out, just like you all do, I was getting nowhere. Now, at 23 years old, you might think I didn't have a lot at stake, but I was already married for three years because that's what you do when you grow up in a small country town. I had been married for three years. I had apartment, I had bills, I had res responsibilities, I had dreams that weren't coming true. But more importantly than anything, this was the only thing I knew how to do. I had to make this photography thing work. You see, just moments earlier, this nice lady had come into my studio to inquire about having her family photographed. And I stress the importance of having portraits to hand down from generation to generation, because we photographers often say that. 
I stress the importance of preserving her children's memories because we know that to be true. And when I was all done making my most excellent pitch, she looked up at me and she said, that sounds great and all, but I don't have the luxury of worrying about my children's memories. I don't know how I'm paying my rent this month. In that moment, I realized I had just learned a critical business lesson. It is too hard to convince someone to value something they don't already value. It is too hard to build a business when you're not speaking the same language, the same lingo as the people you want to serve. You see, I was speaking the lingo of, of you know, thinking ahead and planning ahead by having portraits to hand down from generation to generation. I was speaking the lingo of responsibility, preserving your children's memories, all of which means nothing to people struggling to get by month after month. You think, oh, you would have thought I would have known better. This was my hometown. This is the truth in my own family. My father died at 52 years old without life insurance. I've had life insurance since I was 19. Clearly, I didn't think the same way as the people around me. And it became painfully clear that as nice as these folks were in my hometown, it seemed like they were never really going to get me or get the intention of my business. And I suppose I was probably never really going to get them. Have you ever had that feeling that some people just don't get you? Yeah. Do you sometimes get frustrated that what used to work in business doesn't seem to work anymore? Yeah. Or what about the, the your client that you jump through hoops for, you go out of your way, you give extra time, and they're almost always the least profitable? Yes? Or the dreaded they ask for a discount or they give you pushback on your prices. Often, the reason we face these challenges is that we're not speaking the same lingo as our ideal customers. And when you're not speaking the same lingo as your ideal customers, there's a gap. A gap between what's important to you and what's important to them. And where there's a gap, there's a miscommunication. And where there's a miscommunication, you end up saying, the right things, the things that are right and valuable to you, to the wrong people. Or you say the wrong things to the right people, but either way, you don't get the results you want. So I'm going to share a branding and marketing strategy with you so that you can learn to speak the lingo of your ideal customers. Lingo throughout history has been used to bind communities of people together. Right? Whether it's a culture or a demographic. Teenagers have a lingo, right? Presumably so we parents don't know what they're saying or texting. Right? But if lingo has been used throughout history to bind a community of people together, people of, of like mind, people of similar values and lifestyles and behavior, why wouldn't we as businesses want to know, understand, and speak the lingo of our community of ideal customers. You've heard it said that a photo speaks a thousand words. Yes? Your brand speaks a thousand words as well, often when you're not there. Because your brand is always speaking on your behalf. So let's make sure your brand is saying the right things to the right people to attract your ideal customers. Ideal customers, that's the key. Not customers you jump through hoops for, not the customers you have to prove your value to, your ideal customers. This, I believe, is a game-changing mindset shift when it comes to marketing and thinking about your business. It's not your job to prove your value to anyone. It is your job to find the people who value what you do. The clients that are the easiest to work with, the ones that are the most profitable. And what I believe for us photographers that the most important reason we wanna work with our ideal customers is they enable us to do our best work. When you do your best work, you have a greater sense of personal fulfillment and pride 
the way we want to live, when you do your best work, you've blown away the expectations of a client, making it far more likely that they will go out and tell other people. If there's ever a path to exponential growth in your businesses, can you tell I'm passionate about this? <laughs> if there's ever a path to exponential growth in your business, it is working only with your ideal customers. But you see, there's been this principle in business for so many years, the Pareto Principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule states that 80% of your income comes from 20% of your customers. Now, I'm not going to argue the mathematical accuracy of this. I spoke not too long ago at a convention of bookkeepers and accountants, and I brought this up. <laughs> So I will not argue the mathematical accuracy of it, but I will say this. If 80% of your business is coming from 20% of your customers, what that's really saying is that you're wasting your time on eight out of 10 customers. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know any photographer that can afford to waste their time on eight out of 10 customers. Any of you? No, we need all our customers to pay off they pay off by learning to speak their lingo. To speak someone's lingo is to speak to their emotions, their values, their lifestyle, their behavior. And ironically, to truly speak someone's lingo is to speak to their most heartfelt, deepest, unspoken emotions. Have you ever known someone so well that you knew what they needed that they didn't know to ask for? Have you ever been the lucky recipient of a gift or an act of kindness that made you feel completely seen, heard, and understood? I hope so. We all deserve that. Imagine, imagine then what it would be like for your clients, for you to know them so well that you know what they need before they know what to ask for. And you do. You're experts in your fields. That's why they come to you. Imagine. Imagine what it would feel like for your clients, for you, for you to know them so well. You make them feel completely seen, heard, and understood. The biggest compliment in business today that we can receive, the biggest compliment we can receive, and what I believe should be our goal in the marketing of our businesses, and the new standard for know, like, and trust. right? Because we've been hearing that for a lot of years, right? that people have to know, like, and trust you before they'll hire you. Let's up the game. Let's take it to a whole new level. The compliment we should be striving for and the new standard for know, like, and trust is wow, it's like you're in my head. When you make your clients feel like, wow, it's like you're in my head, you have created such depth to a relationship that those are the customers that will come back to you year after year. When you've made somebody feel like, wow, it's like you're in my head, those are the customers that will be eager to tell other people about you. And you know what? You can get paid what you're worth. Who wants that? You can get paid what you're worth because the depth of relationship will always be more than the price. So after this nice lady left my studio, I realized <laughs> I have a lot to do. I thought, well, if my ideal customers aren't here, who are they? And I realized she actually had given me the answer because she said she didn't have the luxury of worrying about her children's memories. So I thought, great. My ideal customers are people who can afford luxury. Fantastic. Except who can afford luxury? Okay, people can afford luxury. Well, they have discretionary income. Affluent people, fantastic. I have figured out, I mean, how exciting with this. I figured out my ideal customer are affluent people. There's only one problem. I know absolutely nothing about affluent people. I mean, I'm a small, I'm a lower middle class kid from a small country town. What do I know about affluent people? 
My entire vision, and yes, I'm aware this will date me, but my entire vision of Affluent was from watching Bing Crosby's Christmas specials where well-groomed people sat around fireplaces with nice sweaters and sang Christmas songs, which I assure you looked nothing like my family. We would have been wrestling. <laughs> but I realized that although I wasn't from their world, I could serve them if I understood their world. And so can each of you. With an open mind, some empathy, and a little effort, you can come to completely, empathetically understand the lingo of your ideal customers. So at 23 years old, I head into New York City, which is about a two hour drive. I had $20 in my pocket to go to the one high-end brand I knew of. To this day, I don't know how I knew of this brand. It must have been in a movie or something. But I head into New York City to go to Bergdorf Goodman. If you're not familiar with Bergdorf Goodman, it is a one-of-a-kind exclusive department store in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue at 58th Street, one of the busiest intersections in the city, if not one of the busiest intersections in the world. I mean, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people walk by it every day and don't even know it's there. Why? Because it's not for everybody. And either are any of you. So I head into New York City to go to Bergdorf Goodman. I walk through the revolving door, past a doorman with a cap, and I may as well have landed on a different planet. I mean, what was this place with its crystal chandeliers dimly lighting the place and the staff was impeccably dressed? Oh, and wait. I'm wearing a members only jacket. <laughs> because it was the 80s. And blue cargo pants. To say I looked out of place is an understatement. But in I go, I embark on my journey into Bergdorf Goodman, I pass that doorman, I suddenly hear this noise. I literally had holes in the bottom of my shoes. And there was a metal plate in the soles and it was tapping on the marble. I realized this was the first time I had ever walked on marble floors. So as not to tap my way through Bergdorf Goodman, I sort of walked with the weight on my heels. <laughs> it was awkward. But I head on up to the seventh floor, which was decorative home accessories, in the hope that in decorative home accessories, that I would find something that I could afford with my $20, including sales tax. The only thing I could find was a tiny votive candle for 20 bucks. And I mean a tiny votive candle. But I asked for it to be gift wrapped nonetheless because I suspected that packaging, presentation, was part of the lingo of affluent shoppers. So the nice sales lady escorts me over to the gift wrap department. The gift wrap department is sort of a, a cutout in the wall. In the wall. I lean over to the nice, the nice lady on the other side. I said, excuse me, can you show me how to wrap this so that it looks pretty and looks expensive? I'm trying to learn what rich people like. <laughs> she laughed at me too. But then she waved me into the back room of Bergdorf Goodman's gift wrap department, which I'm sure would never happen today. And you know, I truly believe we meet these people in our lives, angels like this, that see something in us that we don't see in ourselves. There was no reason that this woman would invite me to the back room, except I believe she saw my heart, my authenticity, and the effort I was putting in to really learn. So I go into the back room of Bergdorf Goodman's gift wrap department, and as she proceeds to wrap this candle, she first takes off the shelf a silver metallic box and some purple ribbon. And I realize, ah, oh, signature packaging and colors. That's part of the lingo of affluent shoppers. 
Then she proceeds to wrap this candle in wads of tissue paper. And I mean wads of tissue paper. She goes to put the candle in the silver metallic box. She stops with the most dramatic pause imaginable, looks up at me and says, don't use any tape. I don't know about any of you, but that was about the weirdest thing I had heard. <laughs> I mean, in my family, we wrapped our Christmas presents with newspapers and duct tape. I mean, duct tape solves all problems. I went to school most, after most mornings with my jeans hemmed with duct tape. Right? How can I, why can't I use any tape? So I asked her, why can't I use any tape? She said, ah, this clientele is very particular. Before they give it as a gift, they're going to untie the bow, take off the box top, fold back the tissue paper, make sure the candle's in perfect shape, refold the tissue paper, put the box top back on, and retie the bow. And I realized if you used tape, you wouldn't be able to do that without disturbing the packaging. In that moment, in that life-changing moment, I realized I had just unlocked the secret to my future success that I want to share with you for your future success. You want that? Yeah. All right. Why is it we can look at a portrait of one of our own family members and feel a deep emotional connection to the person in that portrait, and yet someone can show us a portrait of one of their family members or their vacation photos, and it's kind of boring. Most people even apologize first, right? I don't mean to bore you with my vacation photos, but they show them to you anyway. How is it we can look at a portrait of a family member from generations ago, someone we've never met, and feel a deep connection to the person of the portrait, like we're part of the same tribe? It's because of emotional resonance, emotional connection, the same portrait that can mean the world to you and connect with your emotions can mean, nuts, can mean absolutely nothing to someone else. Similarly, you want to create a brand that has a deep emotional connection with your ideal customers and means nothing to anyone else because you want to attract your ideal customers, those that are the most profitable, those that are the easiest to work with, those that enable you to do your best work, those that feel like you get them, and those that say, wow, it's like you're in my head. Is this making sense? Yeah. Look. It's the job of the photographer or business to know their subject or ideal customer so well that you create a portrait or a brand to be put on display that connects to the viewer or your ideal customer. This is how you create a connection. This is how you create engagement. This is how you stand out. The way to stand out today is not by fulfilling their needs or wowing your client or even offering good customer service. The real secret to success is to know who you are meant to serve and then know everything about them, their emotions, their values, their priorities, their lifestyle, and then build a brand that speaks to them. Most businesses at best serve their customers. But do they see them? I mean, really see them the way we photographers see our subjects. Because if we just see what's in front of us, we create a snapshot, a buyer persona, an avatar, a target market. But if we truly see our customers, we create a portrait. Bergdorf Goodman knew the portrait of their ideal customer. And no tape was a secret language. Every market has a secret language. High end, low end, everything in between. I assure you with full confidence, every market that you want to reach has a secret language. 
What I love about the concept of learning to speak the lingo of your ideal customers is that it's adaptable so that you all can take the strategies I'm sharing with you back to your hometown or wherever you do business and know that you can adapt it to fit and speak the lingo of your ideal customer. No tape was a secret language. And when I realized this, I got insanely curious about what else I didn't know about this new ideal customer. And I want to encourage you to get insanely curious about what you don't know about your ideal customer. Think of it, think of it like radio frequencies, right? We all have a genre of music that we like, right? I have the musical taste of a 14-year-old girl. Ariana Grande is my girl. And my love life looks a lot like thank you next. <laughs> I actually just said that out loud, didn't I? <laughs> but like radio frequencies, we have a, a frequency that we want to listen to, but we know that there are other genres of music and other frequencies going on in other channels, yes? So the question is, do you want to be brave enough, bold enough, and curious enough to hop onto other channels, other frequencies, and get to know your ideal customers that you may not yet know about? Be curious about what you don't know, because here's what I will promise you. It will fulfill you in ways that you can't imagine, not only in the, your business development and in getting the business of your dreams, but how it will make you feel because really, what feels any better than caring about people so much that you care about their values, their behaviors, and their lifestyle? So I got curious, and I started walking around Bergdorf Goodman. When I left the gift wrap department, there were designer names everywhere, making things look you know, custom and expensive. My business at the time was not in my name. I started turning over merchandise. And I noticed the prices were all rounded off, $250, $500, $3,000, but no cents. The stores I was accustomed to going to, everything was priced down to the penny. I also noticed there were no registers to be seen. They all seemed to be mysteriously tucked away behind a, a wall or something. And yet the stores I went to, the registers were lined up like cattle corral. So with this curiosity, I gave myself three months to rebrand and relaunch my business and come to completely understand the lingo of the people I felt I was meant to serve. And in one year, my business multiplied five times. And within a few years, it was a seven-figure photography business. I'm in my late 20s. And I say that only because I want you to understand these results are possible for you too. Whatever results are meaningful to you. But was it life-changing for me? Absolutely. Because I learned to speak the lingo of the people I was meant to serve. No longer trying to convince anybody of anything. Right. So, I want to encourage you to be curious about what you can learn about people you don't yet know about so that you can attract your ideal customers, so that you can understand them deeply. So if you're no longer in the business of convincing people of anything, you're now in the business of attracting. You're in the business of attracting. You're no longer hunting and chasing. Okay? Isn't it starting to sound easier already? But you're now in the business of attracting. And if you're in the business of attracting your ideal customers, defining your ideal customer begins with you. And I know this is opposite of everything we've ever heard in business because we've been told that a market is to be targeted, that we're to sell to people, to market at people. But let's face it, fellow photographers, this is not the first time we've realized we think differently. In fact, it's probably not the first time you've thought that doing business is a little creepy. But I believe it's because we as creative business owners have never been 
shown a way, maybe until today, I hopefully today, but maybe it's because we've never been given a way to be in business that feels natural to us and leverages who we are at our highest value. Do you want to come to understand who you are at your highest value? Here's an idea. Make a list of compliments that you've been hearing throughout your life. And I hope it's a long list, but make a list of compliments you've been hearing throughout your life and pay particular attention to those compliments that you want to brush off. Because it's those compliments, the compliments that are so natural to who you are, so easy for you, that you almost can't see the value in them. That's the world telling you who you are, what they see in you at your highest value. This is why creatives so often have a hard time getting paid what they're worth. Because we're so programmed to get paid for what's hard. But what, who you are at your highest value is actually what comes easiest to you. So make a list of your compliments and pay particular attention to those compliments you just want to brush off because they're so natural and innate to who you are. Throughout my life, I've been, um, well, complimented or teased. <laughs> Because compliments and teasing can kind of go hands in hand. Let's just say that throughout my life, I've, it's been pointed out to me that I am insanely organized. Do you know who loves that? Affluent people. People who live their lives with every T crossed and I dotted. People who need to care about how they're seen by their friends and peers. It's just one thing that made me a perfect fit for my ideal customers. But you know what? It was a powerful thing that I was so insanely organized. They never had to worry about whether their portraits are gonna be done on time. They didn't have to worry about the portraits that I sent to their clients on, or their family members on their behalf. They didn't have to worry about whether they're gonna get there. They didn't have to worry about when they received their custom designed holiday cards, whether they had to go out and buy a matching pen to match the return address because we gave them the pen. So they could address their envelopes and it matched the return address. When I tapped into the power of who I am at my highest value, it was the easiest thing in the world for me to do because I am so anal type A and every other adjective that you can come up with. I mean, do you know the effort I put into these boots? I was so excited when I saw how high the stage was. I'm like, great boot angle. <laughs> Some of you think I'm kidding. Many of you know I'm not. <laughs> Obsess over boots. But that's who you are at your highest value. Do you know how as photographers, with a slight change of angle, how we can give people a way to look at something in a way that they've never seen it that way before? You've chosen a unique angle. You have a unique angle in how you see what you do that separates you from everybody else. This is the competition buster in all industries. When you understand your unique angle, how you look at what you do differently than everybody else, and you highlight that, the people that are fascinated by your unique angle, those that feel like, wow, I get that, that's different, I've never looked at it that way before. Those are the people that will be attracted to you. Your unique angle cannot be rep rep replicated by anybody else because your unique angle consists of, really, you're the story of your life up to this point. It's the imp early impressions from your childhood. It's your education, your career path, relationships you've been in and out of. All of that are bits of information that gives you commitment and conviction and passion about what you do and the way you see what you do that's different than everybody else. Whether you're a wedding photographer, a pet photographer, a, a boudoir photographer, a family photographer, you have a unique angle on how you see what you do. Highlight that. This will separate you from everyone else. I've actually been doing it all afternoon because my unique angle on branding is through the lens of a portrait photographer. How many speakers, photographers, branding consultants do you think there are? Probably not many. This photo, 
was taken by a friend of mine off the uh, coast of Laguna Beach, California. Rich paddle boards every morning off Laguna Beach and has been doing this for years. And over the years, he has, not kidding you, developed a relationship with the whales and dolphins in Laguna Beach. When he paddle boards in the morning, they, they come out and they greet him. They bring their newborn calves and babies. I don't know anything other than that, but they bring their calves and babies out to meet him. And Rich has been photographing them for years. And he recently compiled them into a book called Blue Laguna, A Paddleboarder's Perspective. How many books do you think there are about whales and dolphins on Amazon? I did a quick search, well over 10,000. How many books do you think there are about whales and dolphins from a paddleboarder's perspective? One. Do you think you can separate yourselves in the sea of photographers? Know your unique angle. How you see what you do differently than everybody else. Highlight it. Those that are fascinated by the way you look at the world, fascinated by the way you look at what you do, they will be drawn to you. Once you have such a deep understanding of who you are, who you are at your highest value, once you understand what your unique angle is on how you see what you do, you can then ask the fundamental, all-important question in order to define your ideal customers. Who will love that? Who will love that? Who will love who you are at your highest value? Who will love your fascinating way in which you look at what you do? That's how you define your ideal customers. They're not people to be targeted at. They're not people to be hunted down. They're not people to be marketed at or sold to anything because you don't have to sell to people who already value what you do. You're positioning your business for success by attracting the people that love who you are at your highest value, and you're attracting the people who find the way you look at what you do that's different than everybody else. They find it fascinating. I've just removed 80% of the bit work from your businesses. Because as I said, the, the path to exponential growth in your business is to only work with your ideal customers. So should we address the elephant in the room? What is it? I'm curious, actually. <laughs> the question I get all the time is, well, but I have to turn away other people. Maybe. Maybe for a short period of time. But I will tell you in full confidence, the path to exponential free growth in your business is to only work through ideal customers. Saying yes to people that are non-ideal customers is a downward spiral. It's a scarcity mindset, because once you think, I have to take whatever comes along, you're caught, baby. You're in trouble. Once you think some money is better than no money, you're stuck. You're stuck, because you only want to attract the customers that already value what you do. You will work less and make more money. What else can I say? It's not so bad. Once you have a deep understanding of who you are meant to serve, and once you understand their values, their lifestyle, their priorities, now you can start to build a business, a brand, brand message, a brand image that speaks to them. So what I'm gonna share with you is the lingo strategy, which is a five-step process. And it's based on five emotional triggers, what I have deemed to be the most compelling emotional triggers. But these five steps must be done in order, and you'll understand why at the end. The first is perspective. You simply cannot build a brand speaking the lingo of your ideal customers if you don't understand their perspective, how they see the world. It's the entire reason why I went to Bergdorf Goodman, so that I could understand the perspective of a world of people I didn't yet know. 
You simply cannot speak their lingo unless you're willing to walk the proverbial mile in their shoes, or maybe it's 10 miles, or maybe it's in heels. Another story. <laughs> but you have to be willing to do the work to understand their perspective. Look at it, it's sort of like getting on the other side of the lens. You know, there's great advice in business, and it is great advice, but there's very common advice, which is to work on your business more than in it. Great advice for making sure you don't get caught up in daily, you know, mundane tasks. But here's better advice. Work outside your business more than on it. The best thing you can do for your business is to look at your business from the other side of the lens. What does your ideal customer need to see, hear, and feel in order to choose you? It's the most important thing you can do for your business. I recently spoke at a convention of small hotel owners, and I, I pleaded with each of them to book a reservation in their own hotel and sit on the toilet. And why is the toilet paper always behind the toilet? And it is at the Omni. <laughs> Whoever built that never checked it out. They didn't take the time to understand the perspective of the guests. Have you ever noticed how uncomfortable photographers are on the other side of the camera being photographed? Do you think I was uncomfortable going to Bergdorf Goodman in my members only jacket and blue cargo pants? You better believe I was uncomfortable. It was awkward. My only hope was that they might have thought I was a rich heir who could get away with being dressed like this. Don't let being uncomfortable hold you back from really getting to understand the heart of the people you want to serve. Because I will tell you again, what could be more fulfilling? Second, what I believe is the most emotionally powerful of all five emotional triggers is familiarity. Because familiarity creates comfort and it stands out. I challenge anyone to go to Europe and not see a Starbucks or a McDonald's logo. You can't unsee it. It's the same reason why somebody tells you about something that you've never heard before, like Jeffrey Shaw, and suddenly you will see, you will see that everywhere. Because once it's been implanted as being familiar to you, you can't unsee it. Sorry. <laughs> I'll apologize now. Familiarity creates comfort, a deep emotional response of comfort. It's why there's such a thing as comfort food. Right? We eat the same thing every year for Thanksgiving. It's a comfort food. And what happens when we eat comfort food? We feel a certain way. We, start, we sit around the Thanksgiving table and we start telling stories. <laughs> One year, I had the bright idea to make homemade biscuits from scratch for my family's Thanksgiving. Always trying to bring a little class to this family. And I, would, I was a family, as a family, we grew up having the biscuits that came in the cardboard tube that you banged on the edge of the counter and they kind of exploded. Remember those? So I had this bread that I was going to make homemade biscuits from scratch, and it was a painstaking process. I had to perfect the dough. I had to figure out how to bake them so they're crisp on the outside and soft in the middle and steamy when you bust them open. I brought them to Thanksgiving dinners at my mom, and there was an uproar. Everyone was furious that I changed a comfort food. They all wanted the biscuits in the tube. You can't break familiarity. So what I want to suggest that you do, you have to understand what feels, familiarity is a feeling, what feels familiar to your ideal customers. Go to the brands that they're currently interacting with. Look online where they're currently shopping. Read the blogs that they're reading. How are they living their lives? Where are they hanging out? Do they go to Whole Foods or Costco, because I'll tell you, those two places have a very different feeling, right? Are you trying to attract Whole Food customers or Costco customers? No judgment, both are okay. But if you're not speaking the right lingo, that's not okay. Familiarity has a strong, this is one part of your business you absolutely do not want to reinvent the wheel. Not copy, you want to recreate the feeling of familiarity, what feels familiar to them in their world now. Right, but you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Don't make homemade biscuits for people who want processed food. 
Do you ever shop at a TJ Maxx or a Nordstrom rack where all the, the various styles are on a hanger, on a rack in one section by size, right? So if you're looking for a medium shirt, you flip through the hangers. What makes you stop? The style. Like, oh, this is, you know, you take it off the hanger, you hold it up, or take off the rack, hold it up. He's like, this is so me, right? Style stops us in our tracks. Style is the decision maker. By replicating and capturing the style that resonates and speaks to your ideal customers, you will stop them in their tracks. Are they traditional? Are they contemporary? Are they youthful? Are they, you know, older? You know, what's their style? What is their style and how can you recreate that style that will stop them in their tracks? Because style is the decision maker. Where familiarity is that deep gut feeling we have, style kind of sits up here a little bit more, but it's so important to get people to stop. And you capture their style in your brand image, the fonts that you choose because serif has a different feeling than sans serif. The colors you choose, because there's a psychology to colors. Should it be youthful and bright? Should it be more subdued and elegant? The style and layout of your website, your marketing materials, your emails. If they're on the high end, it's probably gonna be a clean, simple, uncluttered style. On the low end, a certain amount of clutter goes a long ways. Even navigation on your website. Higher end, they want to breeze through that website. On the low end, I like a little bit of a challenge. I like tripping over things at Walmart. It's a style, and it's intentional. Style is the decision maker. Next on our journey is pricing. Do you know how as photographers we can create whatever perception we choose to by how we photograph something? I used to have a, a portrait hanging in my gallery of a little boy sitting at the base of a column and around the column was a black and white checkered floor, and in the background, a beautiful staircase. People would say all the time, that's so beautiful, I, but I don't have a home that beautiful. Of course they did. But I would say to them, well, either to this family, this house was under complete construction. We laid down just enough floor so within the angle, the view of the camera, and the staircase in the background with the beautiful wrought iron railing, there were no steps in the staircase. As photographers, you know you have such power to create whatever perception you want with how you photograph something, guess what? You have the same power to create a perception of how your business is perceived by how you price your business. You have the power to, see, to decide how your business is perceived by how you price your services. And I will tell you, if you're not pricing your services high enough, you are creating what could be an inaccurate perception. I'll bet there isn't anybody here in here who hasn't at some point chosen to not buy something because it was inexpensive and you perceived it as being cheap. Or what is your perception if you go to a restaurant and there's no prices on the menu? Pricing creates perception. You have the power to decide how people perceive your business. When people, when people come to me for branding consulting work and we start working on their brand image and how we're gonna convey that and price point, the first thing I ask them is how do you want your business to be perceived? It's your choice for you to decide how you want your business to be perceived. The opposite is also true. Here's a probably bigger problem I see, particularly with photographers. The brand image, you're, the perception you're creating isn't even close to what you're actually charging which is why when people come in, they're shocked. They ask for discounts, there's a pushback because you haven't accurately portrayed the approximate price point that you're charging. And people are shocked. So if you're seeing that in your business, it's an indicator that you're not conveying an accurate price point in your brand image and message. And I know we, price, we photographers often fear pricing, but why waste your time on people who can't afford you or are going to give you pushback on your prices? I'll tell you a story that I don't share publicly very often and you'll understand why. When I was in the three months when I was rebranding my business, I was still doing business in my old hometown and in the new market as well, which were two hours apart by car, but worlds apart in every other way. So I didn't worry about them cross marketing too much. But in my hometown, I was charging for an eight by 10, $48.02. $48.02.
That's because I had learned a pricing formula in photography school and I followed it verbatim. <laughs> I was 20, give me a break. <laughs> but in the new market, same eight by 10, $300. Why? I had to create a perception that I was gonna be exclusive, high quality, and not for everybody. Granted, it was packaged nicer. It was in tissue in a nice box tied with ribbon. But it was the same eight by 10. If I had charged $48.02 in the new market, I never would have made it. I will say to this day, I think that's the number one reason that I succeeded is because I positioned my, the perception of my business accurately. And the power is yours to decide how do you want your business per be perceived and what's an accurate price point to convey that perception. So now we come to the fifth and final step, the grand finale, the grand poopa, or whatever that is. And now you'll understand why these five steps must be done in order. You'll also understand why businesses are inherently built backwards especially us creative businesses, because how does, it, how does it usually go? We're good at taking pictures. People tell us we're good at taking pictures, so we're encouraged to take more pictures. And at some point, we have the idea, or somebody suggests to us we can make a business out of this. So we launch a business. What do we do? We have a logo designed. We have a business card made. We launch a website, and we fill it up with words saying all the things that we, we want to say and everything about ourselves. You heard Phil this morning, if those of you that are here talk about weeing on your customers. We say everything about ourselves and then we run around for years hunting down and chasing customers and trying to fit people into the box we created when the right way to build a business is to understand their perspective, what feels familiar to them. Do it in a style that resonates and speaks for them and position your business how you want it to be perceived. And now you can apply the words, the lingo of your ideal customers. Now you can speak to them. Every business has been doing this backwards. We're starting with the words. We have to understand people's perception, what feels familiar, the style that resonates for them, what position they want through the perception we're creating. And then we can talk to them. That's why these five steps must be done in order. The two most effective ways that I know of, or strategies, I should say, to actually really use words well are what I call a standout statement and self-identifying questions. A standout statement is, whoops, back up. A standout statement is a short sentence, six, uh, three to nine words, that lets the world know instantly who you stand for, excuse me, what you stand for, whom you stand up for, which is them, and in a way that's so clever it stands out. And here's why this is important. Because in today's world, you have seconds to create an instant impression to your customers. Seconds. It's what I call front-facing branding. You have to put your core message up front. Why? It's a noisier market than it's ever been. People have less attention. They're giving your whatever you have to say, less attention. And here's the most important reason of all that you have to make a strong first impression, let the world know what you stand for, whom you stand for, and do it in a way that's so interesting it stands out, is because more than 60% of people encountering your website and all your marketing materials are on mobile devices. And people on mobile devices don't change pages. This is so important, Google ranks your website based on page load time. You have to let the world know so quickly what you stand for, who you stand up for, and be so interesting it stands out. A standout statement is sort of a modern day slogan or tagline, but so very different. Because slogans and taglines tend to be thought up in the head. The standout statement has an energy to it because you know what's more important than words? The energy of the words. Do you know how somebody can say something to you in two different ways and it can feel very different? the energy of words, a standout statement, your ideal customers feel the energy because you've done the work to understand their perspective, what feels familiar, the style that speaks to them and position and created the correct perception of your business. And because you've done that, they can feel what you're saying is being true. Stand out statement. Second strategy is what I call self-identifying questions. And guys, 
this is the strongest marketing technique I have ever come up with or ever seen. Self-identifying questions. Self-identifying questions is posing the questions that speak to their pains, their dreams, their thoughts that are in their head. But because you know them so well at this point, you can craft questions or statements that to them feel like, wow, it's like you're in my head. How else would you know that? You're sh it's a shared experience. You're sharing your values and connecting with people who have similar values. And because of that, they can feel the energy of it. Self-identifying questions are so powerful. And because you know them so well, you can actually speak to the things that they're thinking. The power of self-identifying questions is immeasurable because it empowers your ideal customers to choose you. You've literally given them the power to choose you. So you're not convincing, you're not selling. I refer to this as doing business in the selfie age because it's easy to think about you know, selfies as being selfish or self-centered, but it's not, it's about empowerment. When you empower people to choose you, they own you in a good way. When you've empowered someone to choose you because you've asked them questions that are so true to their hearts and thoughts, you've empowered them to choose you. And when you've empowered people, you give them a sense of ownership. When they feel like they own you, man, they show up 120% committed to creating value with you. Those are the clients that show up in the game, 120%. So you're not creating all the value on your own. And this is what enables you to do your best work. When you've given someone the power to choose you and they feel like they have a sense of ownership over you, this is what gets them so excited they want to tell everybody else because they feel like a rock star by choosing you. Right? Standout statement self-identifying questions, incredibly powerful for the use of words for you to attract your ideal customers. You know, it's an amazing thing that we do for a living. We capture people's weddings, we capture their family portraits, we capture their, their family reunions, we capture their moments of truth. We should never take this for granted, what we do as photographers. It's unbelievable. We capture people's moments of truth. I hope today that we created a moment of truth here together because you were my ideal audience. You showed up 120% committed. And hopefully today we created value together that will give your business a moment of truth. The moment when you realize there's a way to be in business that feels so natural to you, you, it'll be a pleasure to run your business. A way to be in business that leverages the best of who you are. I wanted to have created a moment of truth for you here today and I wanna support you, sincerely support you. So please take out your phones and take advantage of this. It's crazy because this is a room full of people so be patient with me. But I want to do this for you because I know I've, I've I've hit you with a lot of information. If you will text to the, to the number 33444, text the word Shaw Gift, one word, you'll get a text back, it'll ask for your email. I'll send you an email with a link to a, a form that will take you two minutes to fill out. And on that form, I'm gonna ask you, who's your ideal customer? What do they value? I look at those forms personally, and then I will look at your website and I will email you back a few tips on the break that I see between who you think you're reaching and what you think you're saying and whether you're actually saying it. I've reviewed hundreds of websites and I will tell you, 98 out of 100 websites statistically have a gap between who the, what they think they're saying and what they're actually saying. This program is called The Gap for a Reason. So please take me up on this, let me help you. I've given you a lot of information and I don't wanna leave you in a lurch. I wanna help you build the business of your dreams. And you know what? I don't wanna overlook the fact that today's Martin Luther King Day. So thank you, Dr. King, for helping us live our dreams and create the world that we want. I also wanna acknowledge 
that this is an incredibly important day for us creatives. It's National Squirrel Appreciation Day. <laughs> and if there's any audience that knows a thing or two about squirrels, squirrel, it's us. <laughs> Having been a proponent for years now to honor the squirrels in each of us. Now, Grant, those squirrels might need to be harnessed to go in a healthy and productive direction, but man, we're never going to stop chasing the squirrels. We had to fight against a world telling us to focus and to sit still because we can't be shut down. I honor the squirrels in us, and every year on this day, I take my company mascot, Chase the Squirrel. He's a statue. Every year, I take him to lunch on this day. He'll understand I'm away this year. But I take Chase out to lunch. It gets some looks. And because I've been a proponent of, of creatives leveraging the squirrel in us, I have been sent squirrels from all over the world. <laughs> I have dozens of squirrel tree, Christmas tree ornaments. I have squirrel statues. I have squirrel mugs. I have squirrel note cards. It's a beautiful thing. I have squirrels from all over the world. I honor the squirrels in each of you. Right? That part of you that, gosh, us creatives, that part of us that makes us see more, hear more, feel more, and in the words of PPA, to be more. Because I know it's in all of us, the ability to create a business that creates such a deep connection. I truly believe and have always believed. And the root of, you know, Brant, a couple of hours ago, spoke about core values. My core value is unleashing. Unleashing. I believe in unleashing the world of creatives because we deserve to have the most profitable and personal fulfilling business that we can have. No more sacrificing that I, it's either I'm creative or profitable. No. We can have both. We deserve to have a profitable, successful business because here's what pains me more than anything. I was at a leadership program 2014. Amongst 20 coaches sitting in a circle and I was the last one to go, and everybody was going around saying what their quest was in life, and everybody wanted to save children and bring water and all these beautiful things, and I'm just sitting there thinking, I just wanna help entrepreneurs make more money. Am I shallow? <laughs> and it came around to me and I said, I just wanna help entrepreneurs make more money. Why, the coach said. Well, because I think it's important. Why, he asked. I said, because I want people to, when they, people have success, especially creative people, when they're successful, they become better versions of themselves. Why is that important to you? And I said to him, because we can change the world one entrepreneur at a time. One creative entrepreneur at a time who's willing to make a connection, a heartfelt connection to your ideal customers can change the world because they see more in you than you see in yourself. You see more in them than they might see in themselves, and you bring out their moments of truth. So please, keep doing the work that you're doing so beautifully. You are creative warriors. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you.